loading up records for the Battle of Drathius V. The fighting started when a splinter sect of Covenant ignored the ceasefire of 2552 and attacked UNSE forces. By the time the fighting was done, well, it didn't end well for the UNSC or the Covenant. Either one. Spartans Davis and Palmer were both stationed on Drathius V's moon at the time of the first attack. Let's see how they succeeded in repelling the first assault waves. Welcome back, people. Thought I'd bring you a little, give you a little taste of Spartan assault while I talk about this year's hunting trip. We went second season, and it was unseasonably warm. So warm, in fact, that my blaze orange parka, down, waterproof, whatever, I left it at home. Didn't even bring it. Brought the blaze orange, of course. Um, outer liner that's water resistant. It's a hoodie, pullover hoodie. Fleece and a long sleeve shirt. All blaze orange. That's all I brought. Never wore the fleece. Only had to wear the hoodie until about 8 o'clock in the morning. And then it was it was just warm. I walked around in a long sleeve shirt. Uh, we were up we were up pretty hot. We were up real high because it was unseasonably warm. Uh, no reason for the elk to come down low, so we had to go in and fetch them. Now, you inexperienced hunters may not know that when you park at a trailhead and you start hiking in to the forest, the majority of your hunters are going to stop at the one mile, two mile mark in. And there's probably some good hunting in there, depending on your area. Go beyond that. Go twice that distance. Go four miles in. Better chance of being by yourself. Anyway, we'll get into hunting tactics and whatnot, but I just wanted to pass that along. We've always had luck when we've gone farther than everybody else that's up there in the National Forest. All right, our campsite for the past six years has been a one-tent operation. Now, I wanted to talk about this hunting trip for a month now, and I had pictures, I put the pictures up, and I tried to talk about the pictures so what I'm going to do differently here is I'm just going to tell you my stories and then hopefully get the pictures placed in the right spot. We'll see how this works. If I post it, I guess it worked. So back to the tent. We stay, for the past six years, we've stayed in a 12 by 18 wall tent. It is a nice tent. We, uh, I've had this tent since my kids were in, like, first grade, and they're now two years graduated from college. So 17, 18 years we've had this tent, still going strong. Two years ago when we got our pot belly stove, we burnt a hole in the tent. And let me tell you the two lessons we learned there before I get into this year's lessons. Every year we try to improve the campsite somehow, every year. All right, well, when we got the pot belly stove, we... We just put used the smokestacks that was that came with the stove, and we did a homemade spark arrestor on it. We did some research and we made a homemade spark arrestor. Well, we ended up burning a hole in the tent. <laughs> Not a good thing. We ended up put burning a hole in the tent. Two reasons for this: one, our spark arrestor was not good. We have since improved that. Number two. We all kind of figured the spark arrestor, but we didn't figure on this other one. Number two, I went out and bought two, three, excuse me, three more extensions to that stove pipe because the pipe was not tall enough. Now, why when you see these outfitter tents is the pipe sticking up feet, many feet above the apex of that canopy? I'll tell you why. Because that distance from the spark arrestor to the top of the tent needs to be high enough that when the sparks come out, they have time to cool off by time they land on the top of your tent. That's why the chimney stacks are so darn tall. That was our lesson a couple years ago. Now, because it was unseasonably warm, our camp has changed. We made a lot of improvements this year. We went from one tent to two tents. Our second tent is a Korean War vintage Arctic tent. Very, It's lined. 
It's very easy to warm up with even those little green bottles with a heater on top. Warms that tent up quick. So we went to a two tent setup. Now, if this had been seasonal weather, in other words, it had been cold, we would have all slept in the Arctic tent and we would have used the wall tent as our kitchen slash dining area. Okay, but because it was so warm, we did two and two. All right, and what we did was we toggled between the stoves. We put, we had the pot belly stove, we put that in the Arctic tent, and we took the diesel fuel stove that came with the Arctic tent, we put that in the 12 by 18 wall tent, and then we switched them the next night just to play with the stuff and the gear and to see what works best with what. Because we were taking advantage of the warm weather. There wasn't a you know real need to stay you know stay warm, especially at night. It was just unbelievably warm. <clears throat> so anyhow, what we discovered was the diesel fuel stove was terrible. It didn't stay on all night. It didn't stay on any longer than the pot belly stove. And the pot belly stove, if you put some fresh wood in it around 10 o'clock, the coals will stay hot till about 12.31 in the morning, and that's it, if we're lucky. It usually goes out about midnight. So what we use in the pot belly stove, we're still playing with that. I cut up some small uh, chunks of cottonwood, because that's typically our, that or not typically, that is our um, wood for the fire, the outdoor fire. But what we did with the pot belly stove is I got my hands on some oak flooring. Oak is more dense, therefore burns longer. So we've been using oak flooring. Uh, I picked it up from a guy that does a lot of construction work. He had it sitting in his garage, so I went over there. We set up his little, he set up a saw, and we just cut all those long boards into one-foot strips. And we've been using that for like four years, and we still haven't run out of that flooring. So that was one improvement, the second tent. All right. The other thing we improved on was our shitter. We've got just a 30 our 25, 30 gallon steel can, steel drum that we use as a shitter. I just welded a brace on it and we put a toilet seat on it. We dig a hole, stick the toilet, toilet over the hole. You know, it stays there the whole week. We pull the toilet out, bury the hole, head home. Well, we usually find some place um, in between, in some trees and whatnot. We hide it. That's what we've done for years. We've hidden it. Well, this year we got a little tent to go over our toilet. So we can put this dumb thing anywhere. It doesn't matter. You know, it's you know, it's a portable outhouse now, and <laughs> that just made a world of difference. The toilet could be closer to the campsite. You felt a little more private, and you didn't get wet when you took a dump. Very nice addition to the campsite. We added a bunch of water containers. Um, I picked up a commercial size uh, or commercial grade. Um, liquid dispenser, if you will. Uh, one of those, it's green, black handle, you usually see iced tea in it or something. Anyway, that was fantastic. We stuck it on a little table and just, you know, easy to wash hands and, you know, grab water for cooking and whatnot. Another big piece of gear we got was the game cart. We had a silly little wagon, which the front wheels broke after about 200 feet of carrying just the of uh, carrying one of the parts of the animal. I won't tell you which part yet. And we loaded up the game cart too much and we ended up breaking the wheel. So we ended up hiking out the elk instead of wheeling it out in a cart. And I don't know if I'll have time to get to all that little bit of the story, so I think we're going to have a part 2 here on on hunting elk. So this was the first year I used a long gun. I've always used a lever action rifle because I go into the dark timber to get my elk. So I'm watching my meadow and I hear all this crashing through the aspen to my left, making so much noise it had to have been a bull elk. Sure enough, it was. It comes out at the end of my meadow. Now, first time looking through a scope while hunting, I shoulder the rifle, look through my scope, Dial it a little closer. I only see three antlers on that animal. He needs to have four. The elk turns his head just enough. I count again. Four antlers. Legal shot. 
I got these crosshairs on this big, beautiful elk. Never seen that picture before, ever. Got my crosshairs on that big elk. Boom! That elk goes down. It was fantastic. Only I wasn't the one that shot him. Some other hunter fired before I could pull the trigger. Alrighty, people. That's all I got for you. Stay tuned for part two. Later, folks.